And now we'll get into Megalosaurus Revisited. We first covered Megalosaurus as our dinosaur of the day in episode 47. Not much has changed since then, but for this episode, since we're celebrating Megalosaurus, we can talk about the history of Megalosaurus and how our understanding of it has changed. We've definitely learned a lot since episode 47. We have, <laughs> yes. But in terms of the research done we- <laughs> on Megalosaurus, <laughs> yes. it hasn't changed too much. In the last eight years? Yeah. Considering it was named 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. It's a small fraction. <laughs> Especially once all those species got sorted out. Yeah. So Megalosaurus was probably the first dinosaur fossil ever described, at least in the way that we describe dinosaur fossils today. And I say that because the first fossil was found in 1676. The first. Dinosaur fossil. Likely Megalosaurus fossil, yeah. It was also uh, also the first and third dinosaur fossils to be illustrated were Megalosaurus bones. The first one was quote-unquote, scrotum humanum in 1677. And just for fun, the second dinosaur fossil illustrated was of a sauropod tooth. And then the third dinosaur fossil was a fish tooth. It turned out to be a megalosaurus tooth. But at the time, in 1699, they thought it was a fish tooth and then later figured out it belonged to a theropod. Yeah, and that was, I believe, in a drawing of a whole bunch of teeth, right? I might be mixing it up with another (laughs) picture because a lot of these early discoveries were teeth. I'm a lot more familiar with the story of scrotum humanum than I am with this fish tooth. Okay. And unfortunately, that tooth has been lost. Fish tooth. Fish tooth turned megalosaurus tooth. (laughs) So scrotum humanum was a lower leg bone or femur that was described by Robert Plott. The bone was so large There were a lot of stories on where this large bone could possibly have come from. One idea at first was that it was a large elephant that Romans rode into battle, and then later it was thought to be a giant human. Thus the scrotum humanum. (laughs) Well, I'll get into that. Really quick, we think it was probably a megalosaurus leg bone based on this detailed illustration. There's enough details to know that, because unfortunately the bone has been lost. And based on where it came from. Yes. Now, we've even talked about on our show before that we thought it was called scrotum humanum because people thought it looked like a pair of human testicles. But it turns out that could have just been an error by the illustrator accidentally captioning it wrong. Mm -hmm. Because Robert Plott never said that. He actually always said it was a leg bone. Yeah, it's a pretty clear part of a femur. Mm -hmm. When you look at it, it's, it's like, okay, that is very much the articulating surface that you see at the end of a leg bone. (laughs) I think once it was published as scrotum humanum, that did lead to people talking about it as if it were testicles. Mm -hmm. Like I said, the bone has been lost. The paleontologist Darren Nash has made an effort to find it and had a really in-depth blog post about this. And it seemed promising because he'd heard from a colleague that there was a bone that looked a lot like it at the Asmolean Museum in Oxford. So he and a team studied it, but then figured out that it weighed only half as much as the original bone should. So for now, the original bone is still considered to be lost. William Buckland officially named Megalosaurus on February 20th, 1824. The whole reason we're celebrating (laughs) 200 years. 200 years and a day ago. Yes. (laughs) And that was based on a partial jaw that was found near Oxford. Buckland and William Coney Bear worked together to study those fossils. And then Buckland's wife, Mary, illustrated those bones. She's a very good artist. Yes, it's a beautiful illustration. And Coney Bear was the one who came up with the name Megalosaurus. It was the name Megalosaurus announced in 1822, but not formally. So briefly, it was a nomum nudum. Yeah, partly because it didn't have a species name. It was just Megalosaurus. It didn't get a species name until a few years after it was officially named. But George Cuvier urged Buckland to formally name the animal. So Buckland formally named it Megalosaurus. Again, just Megalosaurus, no species name. But it got that formal name on February 20th of 1824 at a meeting of the Geological Society of London, which is the same meeting where Coney Bear described a complete plesiosaurus. So a lot going on at that meeting. Yeah. When I read it, To me, it 
felt a little bit like a plead, and I'll I'll read it to you and then maybe you'll see what I mean. He said, quote, I am induced to lay before the Geological Society the annexed representations of parts of the skeleton of an enormous fossil animal found at Stonesfield near Woodstock, about 12 miles to the northwest of Oxford, in the hope that, imperfect as are the present materials, their communication to the public may induce those who possess other parts of the same reptile to transmit to the society such further information as may lead to a more complete elucidation of its osteology, end quote. So to me, that sounded like, uh, please, we've named this dinosaur, or we've named, because the word dinosaur hadn't been coined yet, we've named this animal, we only have a few of its bones, if you have more information, please let us know. Mm -hmm. That's how it sounded like to me. Yeah, it does sound that way, especially where they're specifying 12 miles northwest of Oxford. So like, if you found anything, like almost like you're putting up a, a lost pet poster, but instead it's like lost dinosaur bones, <laughs> last yeah. seen 12 miles northwest of Oxford, please <laughs> contact Georges Cuvier. <laughs> well, William Buckland. Oh yeah, Buckland. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. Like I said, they named it based on that right lower jaw with one tooth, but there were also some vertebrae, a neck rib, a rib, parts of the pelvis and hips, a thigh bone, and a part of the foot. So it's not a bad start. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, it's a lot better than finds today often are. Mm. And you can see most of these bones at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History, which we have, and it's a really cool display. It is. It's very old school. It's also a very old school building, so mm -hmm. it all fits together nicely. But it is cool to see just sort of the humble beginnings. Even though it is better than some finds, there's no complete skull. You mostly have that jaw is the most charismatic part of the fossil mm -hmm. with a couple teeth in it. And yeah, there is a hip and some leg going with it. So you get sort of the general idea about how big it is and the fact that it probably stood bipedally fairly tall-ish, and that it had big, sharp teeth. Mm -hmm. But other than that, you don't really get much of a sense of what it exactly looked like. Right. But there is a good description of the history of how it was found, and then some illustrations that show how we, how our understanding of how it's looked has changed over the years. Yes. Yeah, of course, as we find more close relatives, we can fill in some of those gaps. Yes. So as I said, Buckland didn't give Megalosaurus a species name, and that happened a lot in those days. Ferdinand von Ricken first tried to give it a species name as Megalosaurus coniberi in 1826, but no one really used that one, so it's a nomen oblique. And then in 1827, Gideon Mantell, who named the second dinosaur, Iguanodon, named it Megalosaurus bucklandi, and that's the name that has stuck. It's fitting. Yeah, it is. Coniberi is also fitting since they worked on the fossil together, so I can see why that name also came up. But as I mentioned, Richard Owen didn't coin that term dinosaur until almost 20 years after Megalosaurus was named. The word dinosaur wasn't really a word until 1841. So set your calendars for 2041 when we do the 200th anniversary of the word dinosaur. Oh my goodness. That feels far away. <laughs> <laughs> At least seven Megalosaurus individuals have been found and a lot of teeth have been found. There's some trace fossils thought to belong to Megalosaurus, some tracks that have been found near Oxford. But as we mentioned in our trace fossil miniseries, it's really hard to know for sure what animal made the traces. Yes. Yeah. The, the footprint might look like a Megalosaurus foot, but there were a lot of other big three-toed animals walking around. Yeah. So even though I just said that they had a good number of bones to start with, that wasn't really much to work with, especially when you're working with the first, what turns out to be non-avian dinosaur named. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So in today's context, where we have tons of different dinosaurs to help fill in gaps, getting that much is decent because it'll show you a lot of where it fits in the family tree. But if you're trying to piece together an entire animal from scratch mm -hmm. without any of the skull, that's not so good. Yes. So Buckland, his estimates are a bit different from today's estimates. He estimated that Megalosaurus was 60 to 70 feet long, and he thought that Megalosaurus was probably amphibious. He also thought that Megalosaurus looked like a giant lizard that walked on all fours, though he did understand that based on its thigh bone, it would have been more upright than sprawled. 
And you can see this giant lizard look in Crystal Palace dinosaurs, which were made by Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins in the 1850s. I also kind of think it looks bear-like. Yes. But with a long dragging tail and a small hump around its neck. Yeah. If you had to describe it compared to any modern living animal, or maybe even including extinct animals, a bear is probably the best description. Yeah. But with a longer face. Yeah, a little bit. And it looks a lot like the Iguanodon and the Hylaeosaurus that they made for Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. So they clearly had a sort of, this is what a dinosaur looked like idea. And then with some slight variations on the theme. Yes. Which in real life, it's funny because those three look nothing alike. You've got an ankylosaur, a hadrosauroid or ornithopod, and yeah, a theropod. I mean, I guess two of them are bipedal at least. Yeah. But all all three of them were quadrupedal in Crystal Palace. Yes. But again, early days. And they gave Megalosaurus the hump on the shoulder based on high spines that they thought belonged to Megalosaurus. But now we know that they belong to Beckelspinax, which is now known as Altospinax. And that Altospinax, we only know the three back vertebrae which has very tall spines, so the paleo art on that is speculative. And those spines are nearly 14 inches or about 35 centimeters tall. Yeah. that I mean, if you put those in a part of Megalosaurus's back, you would end up with a hump. Yep. <laughs> so that's totally reasonable. <laughs> and I'll get into what we think Megalosaurus looks like today, but first, another break for our sponsors. So now, Megalosaurus is estimated to be about 30 feet or 9 meters long and weighing 1,500 pounds or 700 kilograms, although there are later estimates that put it at 20 feet or 6 meters long. So it's, what, half to a third of the original length yep. estimate? Yep. I mean, 60 to 70 feet long for a predator would be really impressive. Yes. Now, it is hard to know the exact size of Megalosaurus because we are missing some bones that would help. And no complete skeletons have been found yet. But like you said earlier, Garrett, finds of close relatives like Torvosaurus have helped. And again, Torvosaurus is Megalosaurus's closest relative, being a sister taxon. So someone could lump those two together, potentially, and argue that they should both be species of Megalosaurus. Oh. I'm just saying someone could. If the, the only sister tax are eligible for being lumped like that, all the other ones that are like Tyrannosaurus elsewhere will never be a Megalosaurus again. Mm -hmm. So like we were saying, we now know that Megalosaurus walked on two legs, not four, and it kept its tail off the ground. It had a short, wide shoulder blade, a robust humerus or upper arm, and it overall was pretty robust and muscled. It had short arms and a long head. Its skull isn't too well known, but it does seem to have had a large head with large teeth and a robust lower jaw. It's very robust. Yes. Lots of muscles. And it may have been an apex predator. But despite its overall robustness, maybe compared to other theropods and dinosaurs, compared to the original depictions of Megalosaurus, it's a skinny, mm -hmm. <laughs> like gracile animal mm. because it went from like tree trunks for front limbs and hind limbs to much skinnier legs and you know regular arms yes and also a, a much smaller head rather than that giant triangular head good point good point it's much less lumbery looking yeah it looks like a typical theropod basically it lived in coastal habitats and that might have been what led buckland to believe it was amphibious. There's still a lot we don't know about Megalosaurus, though. At one point, there was even a debate about whether or not Megalosaurus was valid. Was it a nomum dubium after being a wastebasket taxon with the more than 50 species classified as Megalosaurus? <laughs> but then Roger Benson and others analyzed Megalosaurus bones and found, yes, it had unique characters in the lower jaw and it was valid. Yeah, I mean, they have quite a bit of it, so... There should be enough there to identify it as a species, and then it's got to have priority, right? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> people have been talking about it forever and lumping all sorts of species into that genus. So Yeah, it would feel weird to have Megalosaurus go away. Yeah, yeah. So the type, and now only species again, is Megalosaurus bucklandi. The genus name means great lizard, 
And again, it's the first non-avian dinosaur to be named the way that we name dinosaurs today. It lived in the Middle Jurassic in what is now England. And the species name Bucklandi is in honor of William Buckland. Yeah, it's interesting because I always hear it pronounced Bucklandi, but it's spelled like Bucklandi because there's two I's at the end. Yes. But I've always heard Bucklandi, so I'm glad you're saying it that way. That's, yep, that's what we're going with here. <laughs> <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, Garrett, Megalosaurus has been mentioned in literary works. Bleak House, written by Charles Dickens, was a novel first published as a 20-episode serial between 1852 and 1853. So I guess that's quite a few years after Megalosaurus was named, but still within just a few decades. Yeah, and that's way before the word dinosaur became a household name, because that's still before the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, or right around the Crystal Palace dinosaurs, but... Yeah, and he wrote in the first paragraph, quote, It would not be wonderful to meet a megalosaurus <laughs> 40 feet long or so, waddling like an elephantine lizard up Holborn Hill, end quote. That's true. Maybe an understatement, not being wonderful to meet a huge predator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess it depends on your context. I would think it was wonderful to meet a megalosaurus. Ew. At least for a, a couple seconds. Maybe a well-fed megalosaurus yeah or meet it from a distance like those vehicles where you could maybe meet a polar bear but it's mm. down like 10 feet below you so charles dickens is sometimes cited as the first time mentioning megalosaurus in literature but it turns out that that's not true though he was involved with the first time at least from what i could find maybe there's an even earlier time if someone knows let us know but Charles Dickens edited a weekly literary magazine called Household Words. And Megalosaurus is mentioned in the August 16th, 1851 edition, volume three, number 73, if you want to look it up. It was written by Henry Morley in the story, Our Phantom Ship on an Antediluvian Cruise. And in the story, we voyage into the past. And Megalosaurus gets a whole paragraph instead of just the one line in this story. Wow. And it's earlier. That's cool. So I'll read it to you. Quote, here is a land reptile before which we take the liberty of running. His teeth look too decidedly carnivorous. A sort of crocodile 30 feet long with a big body mounted on high thick legs is not likely to be friendly with our legs and bodies. Megalosaurus is his name and doubtless greedy is his nature. Mercy upon us. There's a young crocodile flying. Look at his long jaw and sharp teeth. He is sweeping down upon us, stretching his long neck out. He touches ground, not after us, but yonder little kangaroo, no bigger than a rat. But now the last little crocodile tucks his wings under his arms. They work on an enormously long little finger. He tucks his wings under his arms and begins running on four legs as if he really were a little crocodile and not a bird. Megalosaurus is after him. Away he runs into a lake of water, swimming there like a fish, and now lands, takes flight, and perches on a tree. That's a very interesting description. Yes. So in that, the whole flying crocodile thing, I guess, is a pterosaur, and Megalosaurus is trying to catch it? I think so. It's interesting, too, that in this earlier description, Megalosaurus is 30 feet long, <laughs> and then Charles Dickens says 40 feet long. Yeah, and other people are saying 50 to 60 feet long. Well, 50 and 60 was the first, yeah. Oh, that was way back. Okay. Yeah, in the beginning, it sounded like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good description of Megalosaurus. And then there's this whole flying crocodile thing in the middle mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, yeah, that's that's an older writing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but a pretty good description of Megalosaurus still in yeah. that, it, you know, it's a scary carnivorous reptile, correct use of reptile rather than calling it a lizard or something. Mm hmm. And that it stood high off the ground, even saying, you know, the big body mounted high on thick legs, mm -hmm. like you were saying, the robustness. So, yeah, that's a cool description. Yeah. I do like reading dinosaur fiction. Yeah. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash I know dino or click the link on the left. <laughs> 